This lesson is per title encoding in 6.2 dimensions. We'll start with a look at what per title encoding is and why it's important. And then we'll look at the evolution of per title encoding, which started as frame by frame optimization, transitioned to per title, where the rungs, resolution, and data rate were adjusted, went to shot based encoding, context aware encoding, and then expanded the control parameters from rungs, resolution, and data rate to frame rate, dynamic range, and color gamut. And then an appendix, which I won't go through, but you can download, you'll see product information on their per title products from these companies. In the beginning of adaptive streaming, every producer used a fixed encoding ladder, and the encoding ladder from Apple TechNote TN2224 that you see over here was very popular, immortalized in Beamer's blog post that you see in this diagram here. Then Netflix invented per title encoding in a blog post that they released in December 2015. And in the blog post, Netflix recognized that some files encode to high quality at very low bit rates. So here we see a bit rate graph, and this is low, and this is high. And then we see a quality graph in PSNR, and this is low quality, and this is high quality. And some files could achieve very high quality at well under 5 megabits per second. And some files don't achieve high quality even at very high bit rates. So here we see a file that's around 38 PSNR on average, and it's in the 20 megabit per second range. So it makes no sense to use the same encoding ladder for both. This encoding ladder could peak at, say, 2.5 megabits per second, and you'd have very, very high quality. This encoding ladder, you probably wouldn't go up to 20 megabits per second because you couldn't deliver it, but you may go up to 10 megabits per second to get as good as quality as you can. But it makes no sense to use the same encoding ladder for a file like this and a file like that. Though Netflix debuted per title encoding, there were some technologies prior to their announcement that did kind of the same thing. And these are optimization technologies like that from Beamer or CRF encoding in FFmpeg with x.264, x.265, and VP9. And operation is you set a quality target for CRF that's a CRF level. And then FFmpeg or any compatible encoding tool will encode each frame to that specified quality level. With Beamer, you set a target, and the software iteratively encodes each frame at more aggressive parameters until that target's met. And the key benefit of this approach is it enables live transcoding, and some of the other approaches don't. The key weaknesses are it's data rate only. So you're only going to adjust the data rate of the individual rungs in your encoding ladder. You're not going to impact the resolution of those rungs, and you're not going to impact the number of those rungs. Why is adjusting the number of rungs so important? Here we see a comparison of two per title encoding technologies. And here's the starting point, a fixed ladder with seven rungs. And per title A reduces the seven rungs. So this is fairly easy to compress. This is a Camtasia-based video file. And it reduces it from seven rungs down to three rungs. And you get good data rate coverage from 860 down to 215. And you get good quality coverage. All these files are above 90 VMAF points. Now, the second technology doesn't adjust the number of rungs. It creates seven rungs here, and we see that five of those rungs are below 120 kilobits per second. So you probably would never use these rungs in any kind of transmission, but you have to pay for them to be encoded and you have to pay for them to be stored. So obviously this is much more efficient and effective than this, which is why adjusting the number of rungs is so important. Now adjusting the resolution is kind of the, the a different take on the same theme. Here's our fixed ladder, here's per title A, here's per title B. And what we see is per title A deployed higher resolution files up in the encoding ladder. So instead of, here we see 1080p, 720p, 540p, 480p. Here we see 1080p, 1080p, 900p, 576p. And what that does with this particular file is it improves the VMAF score. So we see 94, 94, that's pretty similar. And then we see 91.46 as compared to 89. 85, 85, that's pretty similar. And then down here, because the resolutions are higher, you get much higher quality than you do down here. And you see with technology B, uses the same resolutions in the encoding ladder as the fixed ladder. It doesn't change them. So you see that it suffers comparatively from a quality perspective as compared to per title A at pretty much every rung in the ladder, particularly those lower down, because these are at much higher resolutions than these here, which typically gives you better quality. So let's see how Netflix compares to the optimization technologies. And the biggest difference is we're jumping from one dimension, which is data rate only, to three dimension, which is data rate, resolution, and rungs. 
Now here's how Netflix encoding works. So you set the quality target. Originally this was done with PSNR and now it's done with VMAP. And then you use multiple brute force computations at different data rates and resolutions to find the convex hull. And the convex hull is defined by the highest quality resolution for each data rate. So here's the convex hull and here are the multiple encodes performed at different resolutions and different data rates. This is the low resolution, mid resolution, high resolution at different data rates. And then you choose the encode that matches the convex hull most closely. And this is my depiction of what Netflix does. If you are trying to find the appropriate resolution for say one megabit per second, you would encode at multiple resolutions and then green is the highest VMAF score for each resolution at one megabit per second. In this case, 540p would be the highest quality resolution. And the key benefit is there's no guesswork. You absolutely get the best quality for each resolution and data rate because you've, you've done all the encodes and comparisons. The negative is cost because you're doing multiple, multiple encodes for each resolution and data rate combination. Now that's more than offset for Netflix because they have such a high viewer count, but if you're distributing video in the, even in the hundreds of thousands, it may not make sense to use this technique to produce your per tile encoding letter. And the key benefit is we're going from one dimension to three dimensions, as I mentioned. Along that vein, obviously this works for video on demand, but you can't do multiple encodes for live video. After the Netflix announcement came multiple commercial per title encoding technologies from a bunch of vendors. Uh, Capella was first with Cambria FTC encoding, Bitmovin came out with technology, Brightcove did, and, and a number of others, AWS Elemental came out between 2016 and today. And they all typically work the same way. You estimate encoding complexity using typically a proprietary measure that's machine learning or, or artificial intelligence driven. You encode to a specified target quality level. And the key benefit is it's much more efficient than the Netflix approach. Rather than doing brute force multiple encodes, you're estimating quality and doing one encode for each wrong on the encoding ladder. The key weakness is, you know, the effectiveness is going to depend upon the metric and the complexity gauge and how you use that data. So you're going to see wide variability in the effectiveness of the commercial approaches. And all these are stuck at three dimensions. We do see all doing VOD and some doing live as well. So AWS Elemental has live, Harmonic has live, but most of the different approaches are VOD only. Now in 2018, Netflix came out with shot-based encoding and in shot-based encoding, you parse the video, you split its scene changes, and you encode each scene separately. And this is beneficial because it's a much more logical level to dividing up the blocks of data in the video file for encoding. So if you use two second keyframe intervals, you might insert a keyframe interval here, which is in the middle of the scene. And any change in encoding parameters might be visible because it's done in the middle of the scene as opposed to at a scene change. And then you have keyframes at scene changes, which preserves the ABR switching integrity, even though you're using variable iframe settings. And if you want to read more about shot-based encoding, here's the URL. Now the benefits are very significant and they're codec independent. So here are some tests that Netflix released. This is with X.264. This is with LibVPX. This is with X.265. And what we see is 28% savings here. 37% savings here, and 32% savings for X.265. And specifically, this is the benefit of shot-based encoding as compared to their previous per-title encoding technology. And as you see, this is uh, blue is VMAP, red is PSNR. So it's not codec dependent. You get much more efficient encoding. The key weakness is you can't have it, meaning there's no place you can go to buy scene-based encoding or shot-based encoding because it's not available commercially from any vendor that I'm aware of. And you're adding some complexity to the ABR algorithm because you're using different GOPs and segment sizes, but obviously Netflix was able to work through that. And shot-based encoding, Netflix, you, you just heard how it operated, and we are still stuck at three dimensions. And Netflix's technology is VOD only, not live. And in 2019, we saw the advent of context-aware encoding, which was introduced by Brightcove and Epic Labs, which is now owned by High Vision. And what context-aware encoding does is it incorporates bandwidth, rung, consumption, and device data into the encoding ladder. And because it's looking at actual consumption and actual device data, we're going from three dimensions to 3.2 dimensions. And this is a VOD technology, not a live technology. Context-aware encoding works by feeding playback and quality of experience data into the encoding ladder creation process. 
And this is from a white paper written by Brightcove, and it shows three different usage patterns and the encoding ladder created for the specific usage pattern. So here we see mostly mobile with pretty low bandwidth. So we see 94% mobile consumption at around 3.3 megabits per second. Here we see mostly PC and TV at much higher bit rates. So we see TV at 21.5 at 25 megabits per second, and we see PC at 63% at 14.7 megabits per second. And this is an IPTV scenario where we're getting 100% television consumption at 36 megabits per second. And here's how Brightcove adjusted the encoding ladders. Now it's pretty subtle, but you can see definite differences between the encoding ladders. So here, because we're delivering primarily to mobile users, we see four rungs at under 800 kilobits per second, a concentration at the lower end of the encoding ladder to serve these viewers. Here we see higher bit rates in the mid rungs because we're serving a much broader range of viewers. Here we see the fewest rungs produced. We see five rungs as compared to seven and seven, which is going to reduce encoding costs. And we see the lowest overall bit rate per second, which means lower storage cost. And that's specifically because we're creating one very high quality file that's being exclusively delivered to this device. The key benefit is that you're adding contextual data so you can optimize encoding costs, storage, and quality of experience for your actual viewers. The challenges are there's no standards, as far as I know, for data exchange between QoS, QoE vendors and encoding vendors. So you may be locked into a comprehensive solution like Brightcove, which is an online video platform that supplies everything from encoding to player to delivery in order to access this function. So what's next? What's next is an expanded definition of both quality and the quality metric that measures that quality. And let me tell you what I mean. So this is an encoding ladder based upon 60 frame per second footage. And we see three different frame rates in this ladder. We see 60, 30, and 15. So a couple of key decisions were to make the switch from 15 to 30 and where to make the switch from 30 to 60. And how does that change for football, NASCAR, and other types of content? And you have the same issue for dynamic range and color gamut. We know that frame rate, dynamic range, HCR, SDR, and color gamut impact perceived quality. We also know that they should be adjusted in the encoding ladder to meet the target bit rates. How do you do this with PSNR, which measures just frame quality. You don't. You're going to need a better metric. Now let's look at the evolution of quality metrics over time. And everything started with PSNR and SSIM, which were static algorithms developed primarily for still images and then adapted to video. And these measure two dimensions, data rate and resolution. Then we started using VMAP from Netflix, which incorporated four quality measures, including a quality measure that looked at temporal differences between the frames. So we moved from strictly static, a still image based metric, to one that incorporates the fact that we're looking at video, not still images. And this takes us from two dimensions to 2.5 dimensions, you know, spatial res data plus the temporal difference. However, VMAF can't compare files with different frame rates, so they can't help us with the decision when to switch from 15 to 30 and when to switch from 30 to 60 in the encoding ladder that we saw on the previous slide. Brightcove developed their own metric, which can incorporate spatial sampling, temporal sampling, spatial reproduction accuracy, and viewer device and setup information, which takes us from 2.5 dimensions to 5 plus dimensions. And then Sim Plus from SimWave can incorporate spatial, temporal, device, HCR, wide color gamut, playback quality assessment, and degraded reference, or over seven plus dimensions. And specifically, what Sim Plus allows us to do is compare files with different frame rates, which really helps us in making the decisions that we saw in the encoding letter in the previous slide. And then we get to Quality Vector, which is from ATEM, which looks at encoded quality, spatial quality, temporal, dynamic range index, and color gamut index, which is five dimensions here. And let's see how ATEM uses that information to make encoding ladder decisions. And we have two files here, and I'll show you the bit.ly URL from this white paper in a moment. And this is an 8K 50 frame per second file with HDR PQ input. And we see the encoding ladder that ATEM created after applying their metric and process. And we see the resolutions ranging from 4K to 270p and data rates from 17 megabits per second down to 224. And we see that the metric told us where to switch from 25 to 50, and also that it made the most sense to use HDR for all rungs in the encoding ladder. And this is a 4K 100 frame per second file, HDR HLG input. And here again, we saw the different resolutions and the different bit rates. And again, where ATEM told us to make the switch from 50 frames per second to 100, and where to make the switch from SDR to HDR. And here's the promised bit.ly URL. 
So where we've come from is this two-dimensional convex hull where we looked at resolution and data rate to six adjustment dimensions as we saw in the ATEM analysis with two additional input dimensions from, from Brightcove and other companies doing context-aware encoding that looks at both the device connection data and the device itself. So what is 6.2 dimension per title encoding? It's the, the ability to adjust six factors in the encoded file, rungs, resolution, data rate, frame rate, dynamic range, and color gamut, and to look at actual viewer data, bit rate, ladder, and rung, and device and viewing data. What devices did they actually view the video on? So here are the questions to ask when considering per title encoding technologies, and obviously it's going to cover a lot of the stuff that we covered in this lesson. And here is product data from a number of companies who sent me product information before I put this slide deck together. 